Is it worth buying a second generation Toyota RAV4? Long story short, no. End of story. Just kidding. Welcome back guys to my Mumuting channel. What we have here today is a 2000 Toyota RAV4. This is the second generation. And I'll be sharing my personal thoughts or opinions slash mini review for this car. And I'll try to be quick as much as possible. A quick rundown of its specs. We have two engine options available locally. One is the 1.8 liter 1ZZ FE inline 4 engine, which is mated to a 5 speed manual, 2 wheel drive, and 123 horsepower. Meanwhile, for this unit, what we have here is a 2.0 liter 1AZ FE inline 4 engine, which is mated to a 4 speed automatic, full time all wheel drive, and has a 150 horsepower. All gasoline. Sadly, no diesel variant sold locally. Another sad thing is that if you purchase the 2.0 engine, it's a full-time all-wheel drive which has no switch or buttons to deactivate or switch to a two-wheel drive whenever you need it. Given that this car that we have here is the 2.0 model, expect worse fuel consumption. It's really bad, but it's a case-to-case -case basis since a car's efficiency depends on the car's condition. And on my car, I tend to get 4 to 7 kilometers per liter on the city and 10 to 11 kilometers on the highway. Most people would say it's efficient, given the fact that it's a 2.0 and a 4-wheel drive vehicle. Some would say it still is not. This car is the best example for the internet term smiles per gallon because it's true. If gas prices were not at a sky high, people would still love using this car. Moving on, if you notice, this car has a two-tone color with wraparound body cladding. It's a common thing for the first release of the second gen, while a single-tone color with not much body cladding is the common norm for the facelifted ones starting from the 2003 models and onwards. They are mostly called the Gen 2.5. With that being said, let's talk about the facelift for a moment. Some of the most noticeable changes of the facelift are the following. First is the fog lights. The earlier models have squarish design with two separate housing for the fog lights and the signal lights. Whereas the facelifted ones have a circular fog lamps and the signal lights were moved to the side of the headlights. The second would be the body cladding. There are visible add-on fender flares on the first release while the other has none. I personally dig the first release because of that. Last and not the least are the seats and the door panels. Earlier models have a two-tone of grey plus blue combination whereas the other has the all grey color scheme. The blue team on the earlier models also extend on the door panels as well. I also dig the first release more because of the color combination on the interior. But speaking of seats, I'm not quite sure if the facelifted ones have leather seats as standard as I happen to not own any or nor had a personal experience of it. For the interior, it's typically basic. The dashboard is not futuristic nor luxurious, just simple and modern for their time. Design-wise, it's just a balance between being an SUV and a sedan. I am the type of guy who loves adding accessories to my car, ranging from gadgets like LCDs to USB chargers. That's why I love this car more the moment I knew that this car has 3 sockets in total, 2 in the front and 1 on the back. How convenient is that? Imagine having an old car like this and let's say compared to a modern car made around let's say 2009 and onwards and yet it only has fewer sockets compared to what this RAV4 offers. You could do more with this. It's like the saying, bang for the buck. This is one of the reasons why buying luxury cars of the past is better than buying a newer car but is bare bones or has less to offer, like those uh, on the lower end trim models. And the reason is because of the luxury of additional equipments and some comfort features at a lower cost. Let's move to the front for a moment. I'm almost 5'10 and my headroom at the driver's side still has more room left as you can see. Steering column can be tilted but sadly, it's not telescopic. Sitting position is high which gives you a good commanding view around the car. Very helpful unlike today's cars wherein you could almost not see the hood of your car if you're a small person, which in turn leads to poor line of sight and accidents. These center cup holders are great because they are not restricted to certain shapes only. They have this adjuster to lock your bottles on its place when they are very little than the current shape it has. It's a really big help there. Pull-out trays like this are still a thing that is surely missed nowadays. A glove box with a keyhole which cannot store a small envelope unless you fold it. Steering column has a small tray which is nice. The armrest is boring and hard that's why it's uncomfortable but it's deep enough for your needs. What makes this kinda cool though is its capability to accommodate other drinks. It transforms the bland armrest to something useful that can add two more cup holders at the expense of rear legroom. It's intrusive for the rear passengers but this racket is cool to have somehow. Taking a look at the top, 
The ceiling has these two bulging lines, most probably for the wirings. And at the rear, it houses the seat belt for the middle passenger. Front cabin lights with a storage for your eyeglasses. Front visors, both have vanity mirrors but are only velcroed instead of magnets. Going to the rear, it has four hooks at the back. The rear seats are divided into two parts only. They both fold and tumble to give more space. And if you really want more space, you could remove each seat separately. No need to unbolt or unscrew things, it's that easy. Sorry but I won't be demonstrating how this tumbles forward as the previous owner broke the bracket. It was good but I honestly dislike it because it is also a compromise. If you want to fold only a portion of it, you'll be having to sacrifice a passenger. Cars like this usually accommodate 3 adult passengers on the rear. But the moment you fold one rear seat means that you automatically lose two adult passengers on the process. This is the reason why I prefer fold flat seats rather than those that tumbles. Since this is also considered as a luxury car, these seats have the recline and slide function which basic and economy cars don't offer every time. Rear legroom and headroom is good, especially for the likes of me who stands almost 5'10 in height. Going on the rear, since this is an old car, space is surely utilized. Compared to newer cars, most of the time we are offered a compartment with less features and less storage space. Unlike most of the economy cars nowadays, this one has compartments which are truly helpful when you want to organize or hide things from plain sight. Not all cars offer this kind of amenities, and not all cars offer a socket on the rear compartment. This is beneficial for outdoor activities like camping, overlanding, trekking, or even for some emergency situations. This is what the car is also made for. I believe this supposedly has a cover for the compartment and maybe the previous owner just lost it. I won't be telling the exact numbers for the trunk space like how many liters it could hold. I don't want to be that technical but I just wanted to assure you that it could fit a box with a dimension of 127 by 53 by 60 centimeters with still some spaces left on each side. The rear door has this cargo net embedded on it for additional storage. The rear door houses the spare wheel which makes it really heavy and hard to close most of the time. But if you ask me, I prefer this one as this makes it look more rugged and at the same time, function wise, it's easier to access than being inside the car or stored on the bottom of the car. I just wish it opens like those hatchbacks and made them separate arm for the spare tire as this kind of door opening are hard to access on certain tight parking spaces. Let's look on some of the good sides of this car. One of the things that most people could really appreciate from this small SUV is the large windows around the car. This greatly helps the driver's 360 visibility and lessens blind spots. Suspension is not that stiff and not that bouncy, perfect for urban cruising and occasional light overlanding. The second gen's ground clearance is really good as is, but they all depend on what you are using nowadays. Currently I'm running on 215 by 70 R16 tires, and I get to have my estimation of 9 to 10 inches of ground clearance as per my lazy way of measuring it. The car is so compact which makes it easy to park and zip through tight spaces. In my opinion, this is the perfect crossover utility vehicle for our urban condition, minus the transmission issues. Now for my final verdict, should you buy a used second gen RAV4? I love this car and this is my dream car since I was young, but I have to be honest and say no, and it really breaks my heart just to say that honestly. First, this is a gas guzzler so those practical minded and people with low budget should steer away from this. Second, Toyotas are good but for this particular model, it's not built like a tank, like what most people are saying about all Toyotas out there. Even if you take care of it, these second generations have a widely known issues of failing ECUs and automatic transmissions. And third, the next thing on my list is their automatic transmissions. Their solenoid problems are common. They cost more than 40,000 in Philippine pesos on the dealers or casa for a set of brand new ones. They are mostly a tandem with their shitty ECUs. Most of their automatic transmissions for this generation ends up being rebuilt. So if you still want to buy a second gen, try getting the manual instead for less headache but going manual doesn't mean it's problem free considering its age. Anything else? They're pretty much okay. I don't intend to diss this model just because I got scammed and have a junk car. And no, I don't do this just to be mema lang. I love this car because aside from its looks, it has the perfect length and height that I'm looking for. I'm just here to tell you what problems you could encounter for this particular model and avoid sugarcoating it. It's not like some particular reviewers who defends the car just because they own one. But if you have a bottomless wallet or have a large amount of money ready to spend for repairs and other stops, go ahead and buy one. It's a good SUV because of its overall proportions, adequate ground clearance, four-wheel drive ready, good cargo space, and balanced flexibility for most people's needs. And if you don't mind the rising gas prices, just simply go get one for yourself. Thanks for watching guys.